Hi, everyone. My name is Beth Keen, and I'm the CEO of Holocaust Museum LA. We're thrilled that hundreds of you have joined us today for our Shanghai Survivor Talk with the esteemed Lawrence Tribe. Welcome, Professor Tribe. We know you've been especially busy lately and in demand by the media with the numerous Supreme Court decisions handed down in recent days, including the elimination of the constitutional right to abortion. We are so fortunate that you are taking the time to share your experiences as the child of refugees in war-torn Shanghai and how this has shaped your distinguished career. Today's program, in conjunction with our newest exhibition, Hidden History, Recounting the Shanghai Jewish Story, is timelier than ever given the fragile state of today's world with the war in Ukraine, humanitarian and refugee crises, and an alarming rise in hate crimes and rhetoric, especially targeting the Asian American, Pacific Islander, Jewish, and other diverse communities. This program and exhibit amplify unheard stories and teach the social relevancy of history to inspire change. It's about immigrants looking for opportunity, refugees fleeing identity-based violence, and a community that work together to support one another. These messages are more important today than ever before. Thank you to the East West Bank Foundation and Carl K. Moy and Linda C. Moy Family Foundation for their generous sponsorship of Hidden History, Recounting the Shanghai Jewish Story, and our accompanying educational programs like this one. For those who are new to Holocaust Museum LA, we are the first survivor founded and oldest Holocaust Museum in the country and home to the West Coast's largest collection of Holocaust era artifacts. Admission is free for all students and California residents. Since day one, our mission has been grounded in teaching students and visitors the critical lessons of the Holocaust and its continued social relevance, empowering them to stand up against hatred, bigotry, and anti-Semitism. We strive to build a culture rooted in kindness, tolerance, empathy, and treating people with respect. The museum offers customized tours, artifact-rich and high-tech exhibits, creative educational programs, and intergenerational conversations with Holocaust survivors. Our student programs are truly making an impact. Students come in as bystanders and leave the museum as upstanders. Since opening our permanent home in Pan Pacific Park in 2010, we've welcomed more than half a million visitors to date. To meet the need and demand for Holocaust education, we launched our Building Truth expansion plan to double the museum's footprint. The new Jonah Goldrich campus will allow us to keep survivor voices alive amplify our reach and impact, and increase our visibility. We bring you programs like this Shanghai Survivor Talk at no charge. If you are enjoying our programs, we ask that you cons consider supporting our work by making a donation to the museum at holocaustmuseumla.org. It is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's program, Jordana Gessler, Holocaust Museum LA's Vice President of Education and Exhibits, co-curator of our Hidden History exhi Exhibition and granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. Jordana, take it away. Thank you so much, Beth. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I wanna remind you that towards the end of the talk, you will have time for a few questions from the audience. So please remember to put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. As Beth mentioned, our program today is presented in conjunction with our recent exhibition, which tells the little known history of the diverse resettled Jewish community in Shanghai, including Iraqi Jews who arrived in the mid 1800s, Russian Jews who fled pogroms at the turn of the century and European Jews desperately escaping violence. Among those born in Shanghai to people seeking sanctuary from anti-Semitism and violence is today's distinguished speaker, Professor Lawrence Tribe. Born in China to Russian Jewish refugees, Professor Tribe is a renowned constitutional law scholar whose treatise American Constitutional Law is cited more than any other legal text since 1950. Professor Tribe was born in Shanghai, China, formed memories in a Japanese occupied city, and then went on to instruct the young minds of a future President Obama, US Senator Cruz, US Representatives Adam Schiff and Jamie Raskin and Supreme Court Justices Roberts and Kagan. It is my absolute privilege to welcome Professor Tribe. Thank you so much, Jordana. And thank you, Beth. And thank everyone who sponsored the work of your important museum and all the people who are listening. And I look forward to your questions. 
Great. Um, so a bit of background context for those of you who have yet to view our new exhibit. The Russo-Manchurian Treaty of 1897 allowed Russia to expand the Trans-Siberian Railroad with the Chinese Eastern Railway. Harbin, a village in Manchuria, grew as the administrative center for the railway construction and became quite a desirable place for many, including Jews seeking work opportunities as well as an escape from oppression. The Harbin Jewish population continued to grow with waves of refugees fleeing pogroms um, and brutality during World War I, the Russian Revolution, and Russian Civil War. Jewish life in Harbin peaked in 1930 with tens of thousands of Jews calling the city home. Professor Tribe, as I understand it, you were not the first person in your family to be born in China. In fact, your mother was born in Harbin. Can you share a little bit about what brought her parents to China and what do you know about your mother's life growing up there? I know that she was born in 1915, two years before the Russian Revolution. She had a Russian citizenship when she was born, but when the revolution occurred and the Soviet Union was born, she became a stateless person. Her parents had come on the Trans-Siberian Railroad that you mentioned from Belarus long before that. I don't really know when they moved to Harbin, but it was, as you say, a haven for, for Jews escaping the pogroms and, and escaping the violence and anti-Semitism of Eastern Europe. Uh, my father, who was born near Minsk in an area that at sometimes was part of Poland, other times was part of Belarus, uh, also went on the Trans-Siberian Railway. He arrived in Harbin sometime before my mom. They met there, they fell in love. And when the Jews really were no longer welcome in Harbin, they managed to flee to Shanghai, where I was lucky enough to be, to be born just a couple of months before the Japanese attacked America at Pearl Harbor. And that had profound impact on my family because my dad in the 1920s had decided to go to California for a while and became an American citizen. A friend of his unfortunately persuaded him not to go to college, said, what's the point of going to UC Berkeley? The friend, however, went to UC Berkeley. My dad became a short order cook and then sold cars. And when he went back to, uh, to China, when he and my mom got married in Shanghai uh, in 1940, he was working for the Ford Motor Company, selling cars in Shanghai. And because he was an American citizen, when the Japanese attacked America, in a war of aggression, although he had done nothing wrong, he was interned by the Japanese in, I guess you'd call it a concentration camp uh, across the river from where we lived. So that was the context in which I grew up. So going a little bit back to your, your father's experience, because your father fled to China, do you, know, uh, do you know at all about his childhood or sort of the decision he made to move to America or his decision to move back to China? Well, he was too young really to decide himself to go on the Trans-Siberian Railway, but his, grand, his, his parents um, stopped near Lake Baikal and I managed to visit Lake Baikal at one point during my life. Um, I don't really know much about his aspirations as a kid because I hear from or heard, many of them are no longer alive, from his friends as I was growing up in an essentially Russian Jewish community in San Francisco, that he was quite the character. He was a real cut up. He was apparently a ladies man of sorts. He went to nightclubs and generally enjoyed himself. But the father that I knew after he left the concentration camp was really a quite broken man. He was incredibly sweet. One of the kindest people I've ever known. The only person I've known who was kinder was my younger brother, who unfortunately died a few years ago. But my dad and my brother are sort of role models for me as what it's like to be a good human being. But I never did learn much about what he had hoped for. He ended up selling cars much of his life. Um, and I'm sure that's not what his highest aspiration would have been. 
Well, in our exhibit, actually, at the museum, we feature the story of another Shanghai-born Russian Jew, um, Mike Metavoy. And we have a photograph of his father and your father right. hanging out with a group of friends. And they definitely seem to be very charismatic and happy and perhaps carefree, which is really how we've been understanding Jewish life in Shanghai before the um, before the, the, the Japanese occupation. Right. So um, the right. Japanese... I was going to say, as I was growing up, I saw lots of photo albums of my dad and his friends in Shanghai, mostly at nightclubs, dancing or drinking. Um, it looked like a happy life. And it was cross-cultural in the sense that they weren't all wealthy. I mean, Mike Medivoy's parents, I think, really had lots of money. He was a successful businessman. My father never had a business sense. In that sense, I think I've inherited inherited his his uh, wisdom about, about finance, it, j it just mystifies me and I, it's not my thing. So he never had any money, but he hobnobbed with people who were sort of among the rather wealthy elite, the um, families in Shanghai and apparently had a lovely time. And then all of a sudden it came to an end when he was dragged off by the Japanese guards and I still remember the scene. I mean, it's hard to believe how much you can remember from a traumatic event in childhood. I was two or three, something like that. And the guards came and took him away. And I still remember standing on a little stool in, in, our, in the, in the uh, street that we lived on in Shanghai. I think it was the Avenue Patin. And I kept yelling, why are they taking Papa away? I spoke Russian, that's all I spoke at the time, uh, I couldn't understand it. And my sense of sort of the injustice of somebody being hauled off for not doing anything uh, persisted. And, you know, I, when I learned about what we did in America to the American citizens of Japanese descent, I used to tell myself, well, what we did was worse than what the Japanese did because we were hauling away American citizens just because of their ancestry. My father had become an American citizen. And of course, it's customary when nations are at war for one nation to imprison the nationals of the country that it's at war with. But more recently, I sort of thought, yes, we were at war with Japan, but not so much by our choice. I mean, FDR didn't voluntarily jump into the, uh, into the war to destroy the empire of the sun. He, Fundamentally, the, Japan, it was a war of aggression against America. So my father was in a sense a victim of, of a war crime. And when he was imprisoned, although all Americans and Brits were imprisoned at the time, my mother, having become stateless, wasn't imprisoned and I was stateless, so I wasn't hauled off. Um, but when he was imprisoned, that was great injustice. And sort of lurking in my mind all these years has been, what can I do, you know, to reduce the chance that people are unjustly treated, abused, uh, whether by, by the state or by other individuals, just because of their nationality, their ethnicity, their religion, their origins, not for anything they've done, but for who they are. And that's, that's how I got into the gay rights movement, how I got into all kinds of things, you know, trying to protect people from wrongs that are done to them because of who they are or who they love. I think it's really interesting from for that perspective for you growing up or being born into a city that was occupied by the Japanese forces as um, as you were saying, you know, after the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 41, Japan very quickly um, I mean it was the subsequent outbreak outbreak of war in the Pacific, but Japan very quickly occupied the entire city. I um, mean that tremendously shifted the way that the Jewish community both established and refugee and those holding like your father citizenships from either American or British or um, Dutch and they were arrested for no other reason because of whatever identification they had as citizens of a country. Um, and so it's really interesting how that sort of perhaps shaped and maybe you're recognizing it perhaps shaped your your future and um, you know, you mentioned that you have this memory of your father unjustly being arrested for, for nothing that he did. 
do you remember visiting him at all while he was in the Japanese camps or um, do you remember the day that he was released? Well, near, the, near the end of the war, there were, there were occasions when the guards would bring the prisoners back home. It was kind of a humanitarian gesture. And I remember my father visiting home and then being taken back again. And I remember once, perhaps twice, getting in a large rowboat and being rowed, rowed over to the old tobacco factory where, where he and others were incarcerated. I remember the stench of it. I remember that the beds had tin cans at the bottom of, the, of their legs. And I wonder, I asked my dad, I think, you know, why they were there. And he said that was so that the rats wouldn't climb up into the beds. And I asked him, I remember asking him whether he was mistreated. And he said, no, but he was being careful. Those he knew who had tried to escape were tortured. He did do one thing that I was especially proud of. Um, he hid an American flag in the false bottom of the trunk that he had all his clothes in. My mother had smuggled it to him. He knew that if it was discovered, he would be severely punished, probably tortured, maybe killed. I have that sort of, I don't think you can see it right behind me, but it's in it's folded in one of those triangular things here in my, in my home office. And that's given me a special reverence just for the flag as a symbol. So that when people burned the flag, during various protests, I felt very conflicted. On the one hand, I thought that the flag stands for the right to burn the flag. It stands for the right to protest, symbolic protest. It's not like burning you know, the, the flag that Betsy Ross sewed. It's, it's just a, an idea. Um, but on the other hand, it was, it was so painful to me to see this thing that my father had risked his life for so that when other people say, you know, I, I don't, you know, even liberals on the court like Stevens, you know, was, who descended from the court's invalidation of the of this Texas law and then the, uh, the federal law that banned flag burning, he said that you know his experience as a veteran made it palpable for him that the burning of the flag was not just speech. Um, but I've digressed. I, I visited him once. Um, I remember one remarkable thing. I, there was there was this black guy who was a guard at the prison. And I looked at him, I don't think I had ever seen an African American before. I think of it as African American, he obviously wasn't an African American. He was a black person in, in Shanghai. <clears throat> and he picked me up, he was a huge guy and he picked me up and bounced me in the air. And I started crying and then he said, well, why are you crying? He said, well, I don't, I don't know who you are. And so then he got friendly and I calmed down. It's really amazing. I mean, I grew up in San Francisco after we moved there, I'm jumping ahead a little. It was a, not, not a very well-integrated community, almost all white, very few Asian Americans, mostly white Europeans. So the idea that, that we are a multicultural, multi-ethnic, wonderfully blended society with distinctive cultures and people of different races um, has been is one of the things that I most value about, about this country compared to the circumstances in which I grew up. So sort of picking up on that thread, how do you think the immigration to um, San Francisco in the US began to shape who you were and what you believed in eventually leading to your, your professional career? Was there, how would you compare your time in Shanghai and your first years in San Francisco as, as shaping who you are and giving you some sort of inspiration and character? Well, when I was in Shanghai, it was kind of dangerous to wander around the streets. I, I understand that people were being executed not far from where we lived. The Japanese were beheading, I think, some of the Chinese who were disloyal to them. It was, it was a creepy time. Um, and I, I think I became even more frightened because my grandparents were super protective. In fact, my grandfather made up a myth about a rabid dog that was running around our neighborhood. I suspect it was just made up. And I was scared of dogs until I became a dog lover here. And that's the kind of thing that changed. Suddenly here, you know, sunny California, growing, growing up in San Francisco near Sigmund Stern Grove where 
my friends and I would kind of wander around and catch tadpoles and and uh, dig holes and play play in the dirt, all kinds of stuff that I never really did in Shanghai. I did occasionally wander the streets. I I remember going into an area where where people were selling um, they were selling crickets in wooden cages that they were carrying on their shoulders, and that that intrigued me. And I remember the the sights and smells of of the of the plane trees, which are basically a form of sycamore, uh, in the French Quarter where, where we where we grew up. Grew up. Um, I, those sights and sounds just stuck with me, so that when I went back to Shanghai as part of a sort of a Harvard delegation led by Drew Faust, who was then the president of Harvard University, I had this sense of familiarity. I mean, the streets, the smells, the sounds. I managed to visit the hospital where I was born. And I was trying to take pictures of it. And then some Chinese guards came up to me and, and uh, interrupted me and tried to find out what I was doing. They were convinced, I think, that I was an American spy because the hospital had been turned into, actually, I'm confused. It wasn't the hospital. It was the school that I went to that had been, that had been turned into a kind of a naval operation. The, the hospital was still a hospital, but I was not allowed to take photographs. Um, but I remember those things and I, you know, I kind of treasured the sense of coming back, but it was obviously vastly different. It had become a huge megalopolis, skyscrapers seemingly going up every few days. Whereas when I grew up there, the tallest buildings were probably three or four stories high. The Picardy Hotel that we lived in for a while was still there when I went back in 2008. Um, it wasn't a massive, majestic building that I had remembered as a, as a kid. It was kind of smallish. Um, so, um, I mean, this is such a wonderful picture that you're painting of Shanghai, which at the, at the time that you were born, Shanghai was actually considered the Paris of the East, um, yeah. on par with its skyscrapers with Chicago. So I guess going from there and then coming as an immigrant to the U.S., even though your father was a citizen, how, how did that affect you? How was that an impact when you came to the US, started learning English, going to school here? Well, I spoke only Russian when I, when I came here and I was quite unruly as a kid. I, my, my brother, after my mother died, found a report card that was written, uh, a kindergarten report card, I think from the school I went to in Shanghai, in which it made a point of the fact that he, he never stops talking um, he doesn't obey instructions. He doesn't have very good fine motor coordination, can't carry a tune. All of those things are still, still true of me. Um, but when I came to the US, I was reluctant to talk at all because the kids made fun of me because I spoke Russian, couldn't speak, you know, I be began learning English, but with a Russian accent. So I kind of clammed up. I was no longer the garrulous, voluble Larry Tribe. Um, but I kind of made my way. And I, I, I remember I always, I always fell in love with girls and women older than me. Um, it, there was a girl, um, I think her name was Audrey, who lived down the block from us in San Francisco. She was like 13 and I was six. And I was convinced that I was going to marry her. And my way of wooing her was to catch a garter snake and put it in a jar. And I closed the jar and I was going to deliver it to her in the morning. My mother um, said that you better put holes in the jar or the snake will die. Um, and I did. I put holes in the jar and I woke up in the morning and the snake was gone. And I always thought that some mystical thing had happened. And I now am convinced my mother thought it was not a great idea for me to give Audrey the snake. So she let the snake go in our, in our backyard. So I remember little things like that. But so the, thing I about, guess the thing about the U.S. was the, the sense of freedom. You know, you could breathe free. You didn't worry that somebody was being beheaded down the street. I got very interested as I learned English at, in politics when I was, I think I was like maybe 10, 10 or 11 when I was convinced that Adlai Stevenson should defeat Dwight David Eisenhower for the election. I thought Stevenson was so articulate and so suave. And I just, you know, I didn't have any clue of what the politics of the country really was like and why, of course, a great and famous general like Eisenhower would, would easily wipe the floor with poor old Adlai. And I was 
basically crushed by that outcome. I, I had, you know, handed out pamphlets and things for Adlai Stevenson. It was my first, my first political job, maybe one of my only political jobs. I was handing out uh, leaflets for Stevenson. And when he lost the election, I was really kind of crestfallen. But I've never ceased being interested in the political world. And it was always a, an, a contest with me. What I really loved intellectually was mathematics. The idea of you know, the purity of it, the, the fact that there were things you could actually be confident were true. It wasn't a matter of opinion. E to the I pi equals minus one. And I just loved that. Um, and I loved algebraic topology, but it was all so esoteric. And doing it had nothing to do with achieving justice. It had nothing to do with the social and political world that fascinated me. So I was always torn. I ended up at Harvard taking almost all math courses, except an occasional course in one in neuroanatomy and one in comparative literature and stuff like that. Um, but part of me wanted to become a mathematician. Part of me wanted to do something legal and political. And in the end, the latter went out. And I mean, I know that you originally after, so it was funny that you mentioned that you always were interested in older women because you ended up going to Harvard at 16. So you probably were surrounded by much, yeah, many older. They, they weren't interested in me. I, I kind of looked through the Radcliffe catalog and I would call these women, kind of cold um, and they were not interested in a 16 year old freshman. I was, I fell in love with my 18 year old cousin too. And I wrote a letter that my parents saved a letter in Russian saying, you will marry me <laughs> when I was five. Mm -hmm. It was just a, it was a problem I had. And so I also know that initially you were going after you graduated in your undergrad, you were interested in pursuing a degree um, more in the mathematics field. And do you, I know you mentioned before that having a parent imprisoned innocently just because of his identity and his citizenship did impact you. Do you think at that moment that's what was your driving force or what inspired you to switch into law? Well, it was a lot of things. The, the, the mathematical stuff I was doing, I was kind of all but, all but dissertation um, in mathematics. I was taking graduate courses as a, as a sophomore. I was grading graduate courses as a junior. I loved algebraic number theory and I was good at it. I did get a summa in mathematics, but I was no genius. And I, I knew what genius looked like in that field. Saul Kripke, who is a, a great mathematical logician was the other kid I knew really well at that time. Also Shankar Sen, Shankar is a great guy who now is a professor of mathematics at, at Cornell. Saul was just, you know, completely beyond, beyond what I could imagine. I took a seminar um, in, I think it was called Blue Indicative Sensations. It was with David Pear, a Wittgenstein scholar. And the main paper we were studying was one that Saul had written in the 10th grade in Nebraska. And I thought, oh, can I say, oh shit, <laughs> I'm, never gonna, I'm never gonna make a difference in this field. Um, and so that kind of led me after I was doing a year of nothing but graduate work to say, I just got to do something else. And then there were just coincidences. Life is full of serendipity. My roommate, Al Alshuler, who's a brilliant law professor from Chicago, now emeritus, Al and I and David Mack, who became an ambassador to the Middle East, were roommates. And one time I was doing math and thinking maybe I should stop this. One time he invited me to go to a Harvard Law School class with him. Then it was taught by this great historian, Mark DeWolf Howe. And it was a class in Admiralty. And it was so surreal. I always loved the sea. I loved Moby Dick. I loved, I loved art. I did a lot of painting as a kid. I did seascapes. And the sense that you could study the law of the sea, you know, and then it was, it was surreal and almost Alice in Wonderland-like. I remember he had a hypothetical based on a real case where some sailor drops an anvil on his foot, breaks his toe, and then sues the shipping company for, be, for having an unseaworthy vessel. And the proof that it was unseaworthy was that he smashed his toe with an anvil. And I thought, how cool, how crazy. This is supposed to be rational. But 
how do you make sense of something that combines human experience, logic, the structure of ideas? It just, I fell in love with it quite quickly. And then, then I decided to apply to Harvard Law School and I was put on the waiting list because I had applied after the, after the deadline. And I still remember a guy named Alvin Tuffler, I think he was the assistant dean. And I, and I asked him, is there anything I can do to, to kind of move myself higher on the waiting list? Didn't have a father who could contribute a huge amount of money to the school. I've since learned that kind of thing happens at most Ivy League places. But he said, yes, there is one thing you could, you could kill everyone on the waiting list ahead of you. And I, I didn't think that was very good advice. But then I got in, I got this old fashioned Western Union telegram that I've saved, this, this yellow thing uh, that just before school started, it said I had been admitted. I was excited. I ended up going to law school and I, I loved every minute of it. Even though I was coaching debate, missed a lot of my classes, I still loved it. And I, I love it still. I mean, Law is beautiful even when, as we now see, it is perverted in a fascist direction, turned against humane values. But I'm sure you'll ask me some questions about that. I still love the law, even though I don't love what has been done with it in this country. Well, I guess, you know, I, I've heard you talk about how constitutional law has a human element to it. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what drew you to constitutional law instead of maritime law, which it sounds like you almost became maybe, you could have been the most um, cited attorney <laughs> histo um, on, on maritime law, but Absolutely. instead you, yeah. you were um, drawn to constitutional law and especially as somebody who is an immigrant to this country, I, I'm wondering what, what about it was so appealing to you? It's almost the other way around. Why would one not want to do constitutional law? I mean, it's sort of, it's the framework within which all of American law develops. I love history, though I didn't know very much about it when I began. And I love the history of the country. I'm amazed by the complexity of, of the internecine conflicts among the various colonies, the idea of liberating ourselves from King George III, beautifully depicted my favorite parts of the play Hamilton or when George III kind of waltzes on the stage. I loved all that. And I loved the fact that constitutional law deals with ideas like liberty, equality, dignity. I loved from the very beginning, the Ninth Amendment, the enumeration of certain rights in this constitution shall not be construed to deny or disparage the existence of others. The idea that it was open-ended, that the constitution did not define all your rights. An idea that unfortunately the current court is turning its back on in a disgusting way. That drew me to constitutional law. It was a combination of history, morality, political philosophy, textual interpretation. I loved comparative literature. I loved dissecting texts, understanding what they mean. What was the original meaning? And, you know, the way the current court has perverted originalism is really a scandal, but it is important to know what those words meant to the people who used them and the people who heard them. When the constitution talks about, uh, you know, the power of the federal government to come to the aid of the states in cases of domestic violence. Somebody says, well, if there's a family dispute and somebody beats up his, his uh, boyfriend or his girlfriend, uh, that's domestic violence. Well, we know that's not what it meant, but words like liberty, equality, those words have capacious growth potential. And when the current court says, oh no, they only mean what they meant when Lord Hale celebrated burning women as witches. They mean what they meant when women were written out of the constitution. They mean what they meant when all we had was muskets and not AR-15s. That's just such an absurd way to interpret the constitution. And the aspiration that people have, they say, well, at least it, it ties the court down. It prevents judges from making things up as they go along. Well, that's just BS. 
it gives them more freedom. They can pick and choose. They cherry pick and create their own history. But I could go on with that forever. I still love the Constitution. It's not a perfect document. God, you know, fetishizing it is wrong. Compromises with slavery were terrible. The Electoral College is insane. Structure of the Senate where a handful of people in Wyoming get the same representation as 40 million people in California. And some of the worst things about it are so hardwired that we really can't get rid of them without a constitutional revolution. Not even, a, not even another convention would do it. So we're really, we're really stuck because it, it's a constitution that despite the way it can plausibly be interpreted to address modern conditions, there are certain parts of it that are just stuck, but they're not totally stuck. Like we could take the District of Columbia and make it into 20 states if we wanted. I'm not advocating that, but I do think that if and when Democrats hold the majority again in the House and Senate and a bigger majority than the current marginal one, we will need a president who is bold enough to advance the proposition that we need to get rid of the filibuster. We need, when we have that power, and maybe we'll have it after the current midterms, maybe, despite all the predictions that we're gonna go down in flames, when we have that power, we need to use it. And the people who say, oh, don't use it because then McConnell will do the same to you when he's in power. Well, duh, <laughs> he does it anyway. So I guess thinking a little bit about the role, you mentioned that you're really, you were drawn to constitutional law because of the liberties, because of the freedoms that it, it encapsulated. And we've seen moments throughout history in which constitutions and democracies are overruled with dictatorships and terror. And really, I think, you know, starting right after Hitler was appointed chancellor in 1933, um, nearly a hundred years ago, but, you know, he gradually moved Germany from a de democracy to a dictatorship with a series of decrees, legislative acts, case law. Um, you know, what is your professional opinion in the role of a, a legal professor? Or what is the role of judges and attorneys and safeguarding civic liberties when looking at the way in which oftentimes the role of the legal profession in general in Germany at that time really allowed um, this to transpire. So what, what do you think your perspective is, is on when things are legal and amoral or when things are illegal but moral? Where is that line drawn? That's a wonderful question. I mean, law and morality ideally blend. The law can never perfectly mirror a moral aspiration and there are irresolvable moral dilemmas. I mean, you can't, oh, you know, you advance one moral value sometimes at the expense of another. But ideally, a legal framework can give you a language and a structure within which those debates and controversies can occur. But no structure is perfect. The framers certainly knew, and they were amazingly far-seeing and clever, that one day somebody would come along with the charisma to capture the machinery of American government and with no character or morality at all. I think they could have been talking about Donald Trump, but the problem is deeper. There are other Trumps in waiting, maybe DeSantis, who knows? I don't really know if he's quite as bad, but he's smarter and that may make him more dangerous. And what we learned both from the experience of Hitler's Germany and here, is that rules can be turned to terrible purposes. I mean, for example, the constitution in the elections clause and in the elector clause says that state legislatures basically are in charge of deciding the method of districting legislative districts for Congress and state legislatures are in charge of the method of picking electors for the presidency. And now we see the growth of this so-called independent state legislature theory that I wrote about in the LA Times in an editorial a couple of days ago, saying, well, legislature means legislature. And if the state legislature, which we have 
neatly gerrymandered and packed so it's overwhelmingly Republican, even in states that are about 50-50, the state legislature decides to toss out the votes of the people. It's abiding by the letter of the law if it just picks whoever it wants for the presidency. And voila, it could be somebody who doesn't want to give up the presidency and who has a more successful coup than the monstrous Donald Trump did this time, a coup that might or might not need to resort to violence. And then within the rules, the machinery, we can end up with a dictatorship. You know, Gödel, whose work I greatly admire as a mathematician, when he had his conversations with Einstein at the Princeton Institute, was about to get his citizenship papers. And this is not apocryphal. Einstein has written about it, others have. He said to Einstein, you know, when they ask me my, the questions about the American constitution, I won't be able to avoid telling them that it's a self-contradictory document. And Einstein said, what do you mean? And he said, well, within the four corners of the constitution, you could amend it to basically create a dictatorship or you could use its rules to create a dictatorship. And the whole spirit of the constitution is democratic and believes in republicanism. There's even a provision that guarantees every state a Republican form of government. Although the current court seems to think that's Republican with a capital R rather than a, sort of a Republican party form of government rather than a Republican government. And so the system can swallow its own tail. And Einstein said, I wouldn't recommend you're making that point when you seek your citizenship. <laughs> and there's a wonderful book by Jim Holt, Conversations with Einstein, in which near the end, as I was reading it, I find this, I find myself in the book because um, I don't remember who told whom, but I was once asked, what do you think the answer to Gödel's puzzle about the constitution should have been? And I said, well, it's sort of anachronous, but he should have cited the book about himself, Gödel Escherbach, which talks about self-reference and the impossibility of ever having a system tell you what is legitimately part of the system. In fact, I taught a fifth grade class once. I love teaching kids. Um, and the thing that most fascinated the class was that there's no way to know for sure whether the 27th Amendment kind of straggler that was proposed at the same time as the Bill of Rights, but only ratified in, I think, 1998 or something like that. Um, 27th Amendment, which deals with congressional salaries, was it ratified so late that it somehow expired? How do we find the answer? And these fifth graders were fascinated. I said, do you think you can find it in the constitution? Can the constitution tell you what's really part of the constitution? And that led us to a discussion of the ninth amendment and the fact that if there were a rule about how to read the constitution, you'd need a rule about how to read that rule. And therefore all these people who say, I can be a pure textualist, I don't have to, have the way I decide cases reflect my vision of, of a decent society can't be true. You, these documents can't define themselves. You have to import substance to them. But that doesn't mean that there's no difference between judges who honestly reflect their own values and say what they're doing and why, and judges who pretend that it's all determined. I mean, like the Alito Five who overruled Roe, they said, well, we have to. It was egregiously wrong when decided. The Constitution doesn't mention abortion. Of course, it doesn't mention all kinds of things like the right to bring up your own kids or contraception or sexual identity. But the pretense that it can be reduced to a mathematical algorithm is one of the things that is a, not just a turnoff, but is a danger for our country. So you mentioned earlier that having a father who was imprisoned um, just because of his identity, being an innocent, really inspired you to get involved in LGBTQ rights. Right. Um, and I know that, you know, in 1986, you did not prevail in your Supreme Court case, Bowers v. Hardwick, but that was overturned in 2003 in a case that I believe you actually wrote the amicus brief for. So do you maintain hope that today's setbacks in society can be eventually righted? Does that sort of history of you fighting for a case and, and not prevailing, but then seeing, you know, nearly 
20 years later that the, that the moral, yes, yeah, 17 years later, yeah. that the moral aspect um, overrode the law. Do you really? still have hope? It provides some hope. I and mean, when I when I took the, the Bowers case, Bowers v. Hardwick, I did it pretty sure that we couldn't win, but that the dissenting opinions would eventually become the law. Because things were a little fluid then. The pendulum would swing right and left. I testified against Bork, but then I testified for Kennedy, believing and telling my classes for over 15 years, he would write the opinion overruling Bowers. And he did, and I felt quite wonderful for the many gay and lesbian and bisexual and queer people I knew who were so unjustly treated. Of course, now it looks like things may go backward on that. But the idea of the pendulum swinging, which gave me so much confidence at one point, is a little less plausible now because they've got it all locked up. You know, they've got the state legislatures gerrymandered. They've got voter suppression that they constantly say is okay because in the Shelby County case, they eliminate the key provision of the Voting Rights Act that prevented all sorts of voting changes that, that made it harder for people of color, people without money to vote. And so it may be that they've got it locked in. It's hard to believe that it's gonna be locked in forever. I, I don't think that a country, the overwhelming majority of which is opposed to most of these reactionary changes will necessarily stand for it. The, the, the people who favor these changes, who favor white supremacy, white nationalism, the people who are afraid of immigrants, who are afraid of change, they have more guns and they are armed and organized. And there's an increasing danger that I hope the FBI is paying attention to that the slaughters that we are seeing from time to time may be only episodic eruptions in something that could go viral nationwide if, for example, we manage to persuade this court and it may still be persuadable on some issues that the independent state legislature theory is just bogus. And if it turns out that a Democrat wins the presidency next time and that the coup plotters from the outside, whether it be DeSantis or Trump or, whoever, or Hawley or whoever it'll be, if they fail, then they're gonna be an awful lot of, of uh, you know, proud boys and oath keepers and, and QAnon types and other more systematically armed groups that they take to the streets. And we may see lots of bloodshed. So I do worry about that, but I there, don't give up hope. I mean, what else can you do? Um, well, I'm glad to hear that you're not giving up hope because you definitely have the expertise and the insights that many of us do not have. So it's good to hear that you have not given up hope there is so much noise happening in our world today. There's so much violence and continued hate rhetoric and um, you know, people not treating one another with human dignity and respect. And I know in an article that you wrote, Soundings and Silences, you talk about the importance of finding silence to interpret. And I'm wondering how do you continue to do that today with 24 hour news cycles and constant connectivity and um, anger or on social media, how do we find those silences to interpret? Well, first of all, I'm impressed that you would read Soundings and Silences. It's one of my more esoteric articles, but one of the ones I most love because I, one of my favorite songs was The Sounds of Silence. And I'm always thinking about interpreting what isn't there. My partner is into that kind of aspect of, of landscape and buildings and sort of in the spaces. The truth is often found in the spaces in between. And there are spaces. I mean, the, the, the world is not, is not filled from top to bottom with option for closing things. When one door closes, another opens. When laws are passed, other laws are defeated. And one can sometimes draw powerful inferences from what wasn't voted for. And I just love doing that. I, that's one reason that the Ninth Amendment was always my favorite. When Stephen Colbert once on a program asked me, what's your favorite amendment? And right away he said, mine is the 19th because of women. 
And I said, well, just take the, the well, I like the 19th. That's pretty good, cool, pretty cool. But if you just take the one away from the 19th, you get nine. My favorite is the ninth. And then we had a conversation on Stephen Colbert about the silences of the constitution, the things it doesn't say. And it, by the way, it's not only individual human rights, it's structures. One of the things that most upsets me about this independent state legislature theory is that by ripping the legislatures from the moorings in the state constitutions, it essentially undermines an invisible, inarticulated structure of the constitution. It's sort of expressed in the 10th amendment that reserves to the states and their people all powers not delegated by the United States to the national government or prohibited to the states. But in my work on the independent state legislature theory, I'm developing the idea that if you believe in the idea of sovereign states really, that they are not to be just led around by the nose and their legislature is simply co-opted to do some, to carry out some federal program, then you really can't buy this theory. States' rights is obviously often invoked for racist and regressive purposes. States' rights view kind of destroyed the attempt to reconstruct the country after the Civil War. But that doesn't mean that the states as laboratories should be disregarded. I like a book by Jeff Sutton, the Court of Appeals judge on the, on the Sixth Circuit called 51 Imperfect Solutions. You can sometimes find in the state constitutions rights that a state Supreme Court might be willing to protect that uses the same words as the federal constitution, but mean a different thing. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to help people do in the context of protecting abortion rights in the wake of, of the Dobbs case, invoking state constitutional rights, sometimes explicitly phrased to protect the bodily integrity of women and trying to protect those rights through the state courts. But of course, the state courts are themselves often moving to the right, partly because of well-funded campaigns for state judges, funded typically by right-wing dark money organizations that the Supreme Court's campaign finance laws have made possible. Wow, I mean, it's so fascinating how you can read both a federal constitution and a state constitution differently even if the same words are there. And I think in a way that's what you were saying earlier about the way that the constitution moves and grows and is and interpreted. Um, I know that you, you are a fan of art and you mentioned earlier that you love painting the ocean. My grandmother actually also had a lot of trauma in her childhood being um, a refugee as well um, from Europe. And she's also a, a great, she loves art not as a profession, like same with you. Do you think that there's some sort of connection between experiencing traumatic childhoods and art or, you know, what do you use art as an escape for now? Is it when you can't listen to the news on the Supreme Court anymore? Or is it just to find those moments of silence? What, what are you painting? Well, I'm not painting anything now, but I have two kids, each of whom is an artist. My son is the uh, chair of fine arts at SVA, the School of Visual Arts and an artist, and my daughter uh, is, a, is an artist in Los Angeles, and I am inspired by their conceptual art. Um, I love the art of Peter Sachs, a friend on Martha's Vineyard, just amazing collages that combine history and perspective and that are wonderful to look at. Um, you know, I, I love Gerhard Richter's paintings. I love looking at Vermeer's, I mean, both classical art and and contemporary work. And I get inspiration from it. I, I can't really connect it to particular ideas, except when I, when I teach constitutional law, I typically scribble all kinds of drawings on the blackboard. They used to call them tribograms. And I would come into class with all kinds of colored chalk and my hands would get all covered with it. And I came in 10 minutes early, drew these pictures, you know, showing Venn diagrams, arrows, vectors, one shape instead of another, inside another, triangles, circles. Uh, I have a right hemisphere way of thinking about the connection and structure of ideas. So that what I like about mathematics, it's not numbers, I'm miserable with numbers, but I like structure and the aspects of structure that are invariant 
under various transformations. That's why I like algebraic topology and mapping theory. And my partner loves maps. I love it's one of the things we have in common is maps. Um, and I love the idea of mapping and representation. And I, I think that I understand things better when I can see them in a visual in a visual way. But some of the art that my kids do is not particularly visual. Uh, it's ideas, patterns of ideas, ideas about uh, aphasia, ideas about looking at Earth from space, just wonderful ideas. So to me, a world without art would be like a world without trees, a world without music, a world without clouds, a world without boulders. It wouldn't be the world that I, that I live in and love. And that's the thing that keeps hope going. I mean, just look outside. You can breathe. You, we're also lucky to be alive, even at a dark time in history. You know, what's the alternative? Never to have been born? Life is, is remarkable. And it's critical to appreciate and be grateful for every moment of it. And for all the, you know, none of us, we didn't create ourselves. Whatever talents we have, we can't take credit for. So we've got to pay it forward, use them to make things better. What a wonderful message. Thank you. I, I'm wondering now if Harvard Law School is going to start offering a course on the combination and intersection of math, art, and constitutional law. And if they do, I think I know the professor to teach it. Thank you. Well, there are courses in art law and in the law of music and copyright and intellectual property. And uh, But I like that idea. I once gave a talk at a conference called EG, put together by a wonderful friend who died much too young, Max Hawley. Uh, and I did a talk, a little bit like a like one of those um, TED Talks, but not quite so stylized, to talk about the relationships between mathematics, law, and art, and illustrated it with all kinds of diagrams and spirals and, and, uh, and the like. So before we take a few questions from the audience, my final question for you is, as someone with over and probably nearly 50 years, or 50 decade or yeah 50 years as a teacher what do you impart on your students and has that changed over time well I stopped teaching regular classes about a year ago I miss it a little I don't miss grading exams which I hated <laughs> I don't miss putting together syllabi I never taught the same course twice uh, and I still teach my research assistants and learn from them and my former students um, if I were teaching constitutional law right now, I'd really have to rethink what to do with it. I mean, one of my favorite students now recently tenured at Harvard, Nico Bui, uh, is a brilliant, brilliant guy whose mother was Lonnie Grenier, who was, was a brilliant pioneer in law. And he has taught me that to teach constitutional law now is to teach constitutional history and what's, what's wrong and why the Supreme Court for most of its history has been a regressive force. So I guess I, if I taught law now, I would teach the history and how we have occasionally overcome it and how law can be used even in the interstices to achieve small triumphs. I mean, I created a little office under the Obama administration called the Access to Justice Office that was designed to help people navigate the complicated and often obtuse and incomprehensible labyrinth of law. And it was shuttered under the Trump administration. And when Merrick Garland reopened it, I was really quite, quite happy. And there are things you can do. I mean, I, I know this wonderful woman, M Emily Galvin, whose mom is the great poet, Jory Graham. And she's created a new model of, of defense lawyering where you deal with people as a whole and not with the little slice of their lives that happens to arise in a uh, in a legal context, you, you help people and helping one person can make, make the day, make the week, make your life. So just taking some questions from the audience quickly, I know we're at the end of our hour. Um, there is, you know, some questions about you clearly like your family experienced anti-Semitism, both in Europe, Russia, um, and perhaps also um, in Shanghai, but did you feel any anti-Semitism when you were a student um, here in the U.S. or a student at Harvard? Well, not at Harvard for some reason, um, although I later learned that Harvard had a 
quota limiting the number of Jews until pretty much just almost when I was admitted. Um, I experienced some when I was a kid. People made fun of me as a Russian Jew, but I don't think I, I mean, I didn't experience anything compared to what Jews throughout history have experienced. So it would be kind of unfair for me to say that I've been a victim of it. It, it sickens and saddens me when I see violence directed against people because of who they are. And I guess I identify even more uh, with the episodes of, you know, killings in heavily Jewish communities and, and synagogues. I, I'm, a, I'm quite a secular Jew, although I'm very spiritual and I have to say I believe in God, though I don't know what that means. Um, but my, my Jewishness makes a big difference to me. When lighting the Hanukkah candles, even though I sometimes, I call the middle one the boss candle, I sometimes get it wrong, but it means something to me. And um, another question from the audience is, after your dad was released from the Japanese prison camp and you were, your family was able to come to the US, did your family have any sort of resentment or anger towards the Japanese occupiers or towards even their experiences um, in Russia and the anti-Semitism there beforehand? How do you think that shaped their experience? You know, one of the things about my parents is they didn't seem to look back. As a result, I didn't learn that much about their history. They didn't harbor resentments. They didn't even resent the Japanese. I was amazed that my father focused on the kindness of some of the Japanese guards. My mother kind of fell in love with Japanese culture. She spent some time in Japan as a young girl because as you know, Manchuria is pretty close to the coast. And the Japanese people that we knew in Shanghai were very kind. So there really wasn't that kind of resentment. I think that contributed to the way I now don't have many resentments. I don't don't make enemies easily, um, although a lot I get a lot of hate mail and death threats and such, but but I don't hate, I don't tend to hate people, although there are a few where it comes close. I mean, there are a few that I think are so monstrous and have done so much harm by by stirring up and encouraging, knowingly encouraging violence, exploiting it, saying that, oh yes, let the guys with the AR-15s walk to the Capitol. I know they won't aim them at me. Pretty hard not to hate that. We have some questions, or a few people who want to know how, how many languages do you speak and which ones? I'm terrible at languages. I understand Russian and I still speak it a tiny bit with pretty good Russian accent. And I occasionally pretend to know a French phrase or two, but basically, you know, my, my kids are very good at picking up languages. They speak Spanish and French. I wish I were multilingual. Um, but my parents, when they brought me up, were quite insistent that I learn English, although they spoke Russian at home. And because they didn't insist that I speak Russian at home, now when I try to form a Russian sentence, it's a little awkward. Um, and I guess sort of a, a lasting question before we close out, do you have any books or films I to recommend to our audience either on Shanghai and the Jewish community there or on constitutional law for those who might not be attorneys but are interested in learning more? Well, I wish I had prepared for this interview, then I would have had a lovely list, but I'm not a <laughs> bibliophile and I don't carry names of books around in my, in my head, uh, but I can name a couple. I mean, in law, I suppose Charles Black's little book, Structure and Relationship in Constitutional Law, one of my favorites. Uh, it's a book by James Whitman on the lessons that Hitler learned from American racism. I, I've forgotten, I think, it, what Hitler learned from America or something like that, that I, that I strongly recommend. And then there are, you know, wonderful, wonderful books like, like The um, Dawn of Everything and, and uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. And my partner reads voraciously. She reads way, way more than I do. And I absorb the books by osmosis and then I kind of flip through them, but she's underlined all the key passages. But I wish I had a list for people. I'm afraid I don't. It's okay. We can send an, an updated list in the thank you email. Um, there are a few questions about it. And I guess the final question that I have for you is 
a lot of your life, you perhaps maybe grew up coming into something new, whether it was being born to refugees in Shanghai or being a new immigrant to San Francisco or being a very young student um, to attend university. And now in a way you're the ultimate insider. Um, your students have succeeded and done so many incredible things. And I know that you have very close friendships with people who are important roles in our, in our constitutional government and in our government. And what would you say to people starting out either in a new country or a new school or a new career um, who might be feeling like an outsider? I guess learn from it, relish it. I have to say that the friends you make are the most important thing in your life and what you do with your families. The students I've had, I mean, Joel Perwin, Pat Gundridge, students who may not have become president or a Supreme Court justice, they're my best friends now. You know, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what else to say, except, except that welcoming novelty rather than fearing it is one of the most important things in the world. If you, if you fear change, you're going to get shut down and closed in and feel lucky. Feel, feel the great exhilaration of, of life. Well, thank you so much, Professor Tribe. I know that you said that you gave up teaching a year ago, um, but you're definitely still teaching, whether it's been in this hour or all of the other conversations and interviews and reports and writings that you've been doing recently. Thank you so, so much. We're truly honored to have you fit us into your busy schedule and give us time to really learn more about your childhood, your personal experiences and how it inspired and shaped you to be a, a, the, the ultimate teacher and the ultimate expert on American constitutional law. So on behalf of Holocaust Museum LA, I wanna thank you so much for sharing your time and your insights and your, your incredibly inspiring thoughts with us. We really do appreciate it. I'm sure, Anna, um, thank, thank you. I've really enjoyed this. Great questions and a wonderful opportunity. It's an honor. Well, we really appreciate it. And thank you everyone who's watched or is watching. And if you're interested in learning more about the Shanghai Jewish experience and the history of the Jewish community there, you can visit our exhibition at Holocaust Museum LA. Um, it is on display through August 28th. We also have a photograph of Professor Tribe's father in the exhibit. So it is um, definitely a chance to learn more about his personal life and, and see a face to a name. I want to invite everybody to join us next Thursday, July 14th, for a special program at 5 p.m., Building Bridges, um, Uniting the Latinx and Jewish Communities in Los Angeles. You can find more information about that program or all of our virtual offerings and in-person programs on our website, holocaustmuseumla.org. Um, also, a recording of this program will be made available on our YouTube channel, and we bring you programs like today's really to fulfill the mission of the founding survivors to commemorate, educate, and inspire a more dignified and humane world. If you're interested in learning more about the museum and the work that we do, I welcome you to look on our website, and really thank you so much for joining us today and thinking critically about how we can create a space for mutual respect and community building. So thank you so much for joining, take care. We hope to see you again. And again, thank you so much, Professor Tribe. We hope to see you here one day in Los Angeles as well. So thank you.